So this is a short tutorial on the mechanisms of CPG module um, and this diagram shows the one of the basics of the module which is the neurons that generates the rhythmic pattern of action potential. So we can label those two neurons. Um, one is the extensor rhythm generator and the other one flexor rhythm generator. So similar to the pacemaker cells in the heart, this neuron um, can actually generate the rhythmic pattern of firing. Let's leave that here. This is flexor rhythm generator. Neuron. And next um, neurons we need is the lower motor neurons. So these are the lower motor neurons that has direct connection to the muscle. So this is extensor lower motor neuron. And the one on the red is the flexor lower motor neuron. Um, so with this, this with this design, you can imagine whenever this fires, the end result of this will be the contraction of the muscle in the rhythmic pattern. So without any further um, addition of the neurons, if you just activate those two sets of rhythm generators, you will you will see the firing of extensors and flexors um, firing the rhythmic pattern. Um, so these rhythms are irregular in a way because they these can actually co-contract at the same time or alternate. Um, well, sometimes it might alternate, or sometimes it might co-contract. So there's no regular pattern because these are not really coupled. Um, so in order to put that function in, we need to actually put the interneurons, which acts inhibited way. So next step we need is put inhibitory interneurons. Um, so you can see there are four in inhibitory interneurons. So all of them, the end results of that will be the whenever you activate those interneurons, the exon terminal of that interneuron will release neurotransmitters. Let me just color. And those neurotransmitters will um, make the hyperpolarization of the next neuron and end result will be the silencing the neuron, no more action potentials. And you can see the designs, the connections here, the branches from the uh, rhythm generators, uh, rhythm generators activate the, the um, inhibitory interneurons which inhibits the opposite sign. So for a particular, so let's have a look at this interneuron. Um, so this, whenever this branch is sending the action potential signal and releases the inhibitory neurotransmitter to this inhibitory interneuron, it automatically silences the flexor rhythm generator and vice versa. Um, so if you also see this inhibitory interneuron, um, whenever it's excited by this rhythm generator, it automatically silenced the flexor um, lower motor neuron. So this is the, the basic modules that we can find the CPG in the spinal cord, the proposed um, module. Um, so we need interneuron, which is inhibitory. Then the final story of this would be to put the descending signal. So that's the descending signals from the brainstem area. And this is through the upper motor neuron. This upper motor neuron is our 
um, medial motor neuron, specifically a reticulospinal tract. And that signal is the source of this signal. Eventually, if you follow the source, it's from the mesencephalic locomotor region. And that goes via reticular formation. So this descending this tonic descending inputs are required to activate um, the CPD module in the spinal cord. So how do we run this? We need the inputs first. See how I can um, create the rhythm, rhythmic patterns of contraction of the muscles. Let's just use the color here. So I'll just use the blue. Let's say we have action potential delivered to those rhythm generators. And we'll see the neurotransmitters, those are the excitatory neurotransmitters. So we'll fire. And whenever it fires, both so um, initially both rhythm generators will fire at the same time. But the end result is because it mutually inhibits each other, you'll actually see no response to the muscle. Why? Because if you look at this, um, there's uh, inhibitory neurotransmitters fired here. There's inhibitory neurotransmitters. And well, it actually facilitates to silence the activation of the opposite rhythm generators. And at the same time, um, this inhibitors, uh, inhibitory interneurons are activated. So it actually silenced the both um, lower motor neurons. So theoretically we won't really see any muscle activation whenever both rhythm generators are active at the same time. Um, after a short period of period of time, the one of the rhythm generators will be fatigued first, and uh, the fatigue is pr um, primarily due to the use of all the vesicles in the axon terminal. And when it happens, so let's say this gets fatigued first. And once it's fatigued, there will be no inhibition signal to the opposite side. So no more inhibitory neurotransmitters onto the um, rhythm generators or the lower motor neurons. So this will be silent, so it's fatigued and it's silent. No action potentials will be seen on this left hand side. But now, because um, this is not inhibited, this will send the signal down. And you'll see the first contraction of the flexors. So, in other words, when the extensor side gets fatigued, you'll see the activation of the flexor side. So it's get fatigued, uh, it gets activated. But this won't last long because eventually um, the neurotransmitter delivered to the lower motor neuron um, that will be fatigued. So now the situation gets reversed. So whenever this is fatigued now, then because this um, down the left hand side, the extensor side um, had enough time to recover uh, from the fatigue, now it can be activated. So this extensor side now releases the action potential, um, generates the action potential, and accordingly it will um, contract the extensor side of the muscle. And whenever the extensor side is active, you can see um, that it also works to inhibit the opposite side. So automatically 
it will silence um, the flexor side. So this will be silent now. So although it's fatigued and can't really contract any muscle, it's kind of double security measure to silence the uh, flexor side using those inhibitory interneurons as well. So in conclusion, um, whenever there's a tonic input, well, theoretically, initially, it will so you'll see no contraction of the two muscles, but soon they will find a pattern of alternating contraction of extensor and then after flexor and after extensor and so forth. So you'll never be able to find the co-contraction of both um, muscles due to the mutual inhibitory mechanisms as shown in this diagram. So that's the how our CPG module works in conjunction with the descending inputs, tonic inputs from the brainstem. Now the last part of the story would be to include the sensory um, afferent signals. So we had the two sets of sensory signals that can influence the CPG. Um, one was the workings of GTO in the calf muscle, extensor muscles. And GTO, the effect of GTO to CPG is um, indicated in with this green arrow. Let me just delete that to clear this. And this green arrow indicates it has excitatory signal to the extensor. And this is via excitatory interneuron, which is not really shown in this diagram, but it's actually shown in the tutorial notes and also the lecture notes. So it, whenever the GTO, the calf muscle, um, sends the signal to the spinal cord, it kind of influences the CPG by exciting the excitatory rhythm, uh, extensor rhythm generator neuron. If you excite this side, which is the um, extensor side, the end result will be to extend the the lower limb and the end result of extending the lower limb is to um, prolong the stance phase. So you can link the excitatory input from the GP, um, GTO to the prolonging of the stance phase. And other input is our muscle spindle. And muscle spindles in particular from the hip flexors. And the effect of Activating the muscle spindle in the hip flexor is the inhibitory input to the extensor rhythm generator. So it's the opposite to the Golgi tendon organ. No, it's inhibitory input, and this is via inhibitory interneuron in this circ in this circuit in this pathway. So if you inhibit the extensor muscle, the end result will be to excite the flexors. So the end result of exciting the muscle spindle, we can see the excitation of the flexors. You can link that to um, now this is related to excitation of the flexors. If you excite the flexors, that means um, the swing phase will occur. And in particular, when, for example, the decelebrated cat uh, was in the stance phase and this muscle spindle input um, was delivered to the CPG, it will stop the stance phase and move to the swing phase. So it actually, um, the end result of that will be to make the transition quicker. 
transition between phases, swing to ex uh, stance or stance to swing phase becomes more rapid. And that allows the um, gate to be more, the speed of the gate to be um, more faster, faster speed of gate as a result. And for the prolonging stance phase, the the results of that will be to decrease the speed of gate, so the gate becomes slower. Um, let me just recap. Um, the one B fiber is the A from fiber for GTO, and the muscle spindle one um, A or two fibers for muscle spindle. So that's the influence of those afferent fibers, peripheral fibers, to the one CPG module in the spinal cord and how it can change the behavior of the gait. So this muscle spindle, the change is by exciting the flexors, it can make the gait faster. Um, for the GTO, by exciting the extensors, it can prolong the stance phase and get the, um, make the gait more slower. Okay, so I think that concludes the um, short tutorials on the CPG module. Um, if you're not really, still not quite sure, um, or a bit confused about those modules, um, just email me or ask me questions during the tutorial classes.